This is Chris Shea's hearing on secrets in the intelligence community. Uh, Representative Dennis Kucinich is a ranking member. A quorum being present. The Subcommittee on National Security Emerging Threats and International Relations hearing entitled Too Many Secrets Overclassification is a Barrier to Critical Information Sharing is called to order. An old maxim of military strategy warns He who protects everything protects nothing. Nevertheless, the United States today attempts to shield an immense and growing body of secrets using an incomprehensible complex system of classifications and safeguard requirements. As a result, no one can say with any degree of certainty how much is classified, how much needs to be declassified, or whether the nation's real secrets can be adequately protected in a system so bloated it often does not distinguish between the critically important and the comically irrelevant. This much we know. There are too many secrets. Soon after President Franklin Roosevelt's first executive order on classification in 1940, the propensity to overclassify was noted. Since then, a long and distinguished list of committees and commissions has studied the problem. They all found it impossible to quantify the extent of overclassification because no one even knows the full scope the federal government classifies holdings at any given time. Some estimate 10 percent of current secrets should never have been classified. Others put the extent of overclassification as high as 90 percent. During the Cold War, facing a monolithic foe determined to penetrate our nat national secrets, overclassification may have provided a needed security buffer. But the risk-benefit calculation has changed dramatically. Against a stateless, adaptable enemy, we dare not rely on organizational stovepipes to conclude in advance who should have access to one piece of an emerging mosaic. Connecting the dots is now a team sport. The Cold War, Cold War paradigm of need to know must give way to the modern strategic imperative need to share. The National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, referred to as the 9-11 Commission, concluded that, quote, current security requirements nurture overclassification and excess compartmentation of information among agencies. Each agency's incentive structure opposes sharing with risks, criminal, civil, and internal administrative sanctions but few rewards for sharing information. No one has to pay the long-term costs of overclassifying information, though these costs, even in a literal financial terms, are substantial. The National Archives Information Security Oversight Office, ISOO, reported that in 2003, more than 14 million documents were classified. By the 3,978 federal officials authorized to do so, they classified 8% more information than the year before. 
but recently declassified documents confirm the elaborate and costly security applied to some information is simply not worth the effort or expense. A former dictator's cocktail preferences and a facetious plot against Santa Claus are no threat to national security in the public domain, yet both were classified. The most recent ISOO report correctly concludes, quote, allowing information that will not cause damage to national security to remain in the classification system or to enter that system in the first instance places all classified information at needless increased risk. Current classification practices are highly subjective, inconsistent, and susceptible to abuse. One agency protects what another releases. Rampant overclassification often confuses national security with bureaucratic, political, or diplomatic convenience. The dangerous, if natural, tendency to hide embarrassing or inconvenient facts can mask vulnerabilities and only keep critical information from the American people. The terrorists know their plans. Fewer people classify, fewer secrets would pr better protect national security by focusing safeguards on truly sensitive information while allowing far wider dissemination of the facts and analysis the 9-11 Commission says must be shared. Any discussion of intelligence reform must include a new approach to classification, one that sheds Cold War shackles and serves the strategic need to share information. Our witnesses this mo morning bring impressive experience and insight to this important issue, and we look forward to their testimony. And I welcome each of them. At this time, the chair would recognize the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, calling this important hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for their attendance and uh, acknowledge the presence of my colleagues. The overclassification of federal materials is a growing problem, a problem that's been highlighted once again in the final report of the 9-11 Commission. Overclassification has serious fiscal cost. It also reduces accountability and reduces our security. But the real problem is not the quantity of materials classified and declassified. The real problem, I would submit, is the systematic and systemic and reflexive secrecy rampant uh, throughout officials in this administration. But I have to say that, as uh, the witnesses certainly know, uh, this problem of overclassification and of secrecy has been a problem throughout uh, the history of this country. And in a book, uh, Mr. Chairman, which you may, or may be familiar with, uh, Chalmers Johnson, who's a scholar, wrote a book about secrecy and its relationship to what he calls militarism, secrecy, and the end of the republic. Books called the Sour, the, the Sour, Sorrows of Empire, and he was also the uh, uh, person who's the author of a book called Blowback, which talks about the consequences of United States um, foreign policy on what happens here at home. This book really makes the connections on how a secrecy undermines our country, and in a culture of increased military spending, together with the secrecy. Uh, makes it very difficult for taxpayers to have any idea of what's going on and how their, how their dollars are being spent and really reflects on the priorities of the country. Uh, th this problem of secrecy is also something that we have to deal with as members of Congress. I mean, how many secret, so-called secret briefings has the Congress had over the last few years where we're just fed misinformation for the purposes of being able to gain support for Congress for things that people otherwise wouldn't have supported? But the meetings were kept secret and that's a way that you stop a discussion in a free society. Now, the current situation with this administration, instead of making information available or sharing information, this administration reversed a trend started in the Clinton administration, a trend towards openness. The Clinton Executive Order 2958 is a, uh, is a under, under this order, there's a presumption against classification. And this presumption was used in case of doubt and where there was doubt about the appropriate level of classification, the order specified that the material be, uh, be uh, that, that the material be classified at the lower level. An interagency security classification appeals panel was established, and historical records were declassified at record rates and on a timely automated schedule. In contrast, the current administration 
has dramatically increased the volume of federal materials concealed from the American people. Executive Order 13292, issued in March 2003, 18 months after 9-11, permitted officials to classify information when there was doubt whether or not to do so, allowed officials to classify information at the mo more restrictive level when there was a question as to the appropriate level. The order also delayed and weakened the system of automatic declassification established under the Clinton executive order and underutilized the appeals panel. As a result, as has been noted earlier, a record 14 million classification actions were reported last year, costing U.S. taxpayers an all-time high of $6.5 billion. The total, pages of pay, uh, the total number of pages declassified by this administration was the lowest in the last 10 years. Annual uh, FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests, have become more tightly controlled, surpassing the 3 million mark last year for the first time in history and costing the government $325 million. Secrecy is on the rise throughout the administration. Officials at the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Health and Human Services now have been granted classification authority while the Office of the Vice President has become exempt from certain mandatory declassification reviews. The FCC, Federal Communications Commission, recently stated that outage reports from wireless line cable and telecom providers would be protected from public disclosure because of, quote, increasing concern about homeland security and national defense, unquote. In addition, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission recently decided that information about the physical security of nuclear facilities would no longer be publicly available or updated on the agency's website, though this information would be critical for public health and safety. And I want to say that I'm pleased this subcommittee is going to be holding hearings on this issue of nuclear plant security in the coming weeks. Information seems to be arbitrarily and unnecessarily classified. Last week, the American Civil Liberties Union released court documents showing that the Justice Department tried to file secret affidavits in two civil court cases challenging the U.S. Patriot Act. These affidavits can only be viewed by the judge and would not be seen by the public or even the plaintiffs. The attack on the civil liberties of U.S. citizens now includes this new tactic. The Justice Department even attempted to redact harmless information, such as a quotation from a 1972 Supreme Court ruling and general descriptions of a company and the fact that it did consulting work. Even more egregiously, we have seen the declassification used to, as an excuse to avoid embarrassment by the, uh, to the administration. The Senate Intelligence Committee's report on pre-war intelligence concerning the Iraqi WMD program was redacted. The entire report a Major, Gen Major General Antonio Taguba detailing the mistreatment of Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib prison was classified, though it did not reveal intelligence sources or methods. Even in this committee, we saw how the Pentagon retroactively classified sections of a report uh, critical of the proposed National Def Missile Defense Plan by Philip Coyle, Director of the Department of Defense Office of Operational Test and Evaluation. The information in the report which had been disclosed and, disclosed and widely disseminated, was subsequently withheld from Congress for eight months. The Pentagon then marked the report for official use only and classified the 50 specific recommendations stated in Mr. Coyle's report so it could not be released to the public for scrutiny. The final report of the 9-11 Commission confirms what all, what, what, what all many of us already know too well. The Bush administration's excessive use of classification delay in declassifying federal materials and encroachments on the civil rights of individuals are antithetical to democratic principle, and it is our responsibility as Congress to provide effective checks and balances, which is really the purpose of this committee. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. At this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I join with members of the public and members of Congress and, of course, the 9-11 families in hoping that Congress will act swiftly to implement the unanimous bipartisan recommendation of the 9-11 Commission report. I must say that as we address today's issue, the Commission's strong and unequivocal recommendations that the executive branch move from treating information on a need-to-know to a need-to-share basis, I'm uncertain that this transformation can occur within an administration that has overemphasized classification at the expense of congressional oversight and, in some cases, at the expense of common sense. I know during the last administration in 1995, the presidential order pre reset previous default settings 
directing classifiers not to shield information of doubtful value and to classify information at the lowest rather than the highest possible level. Reclassification was prohibited if the material has otherwise been properly put in the public domain. Under this President Bush, uh, his executive order reverts to a when in doubt classify standard, expands classification authorities in, categor in categories and postpones automatic declassification on some records. Now this leads us here today to ask the witness how can the administration convince the skeptical public that the administration is committed to changing this culture when even as we speak they're continuing to classify in some cases retroactively information pertaining to our national defense. One key example was mentioned briefly by Mr. Kucinich it has to do with missile defense. I happen to have a longer history with this issue and so want to take a moment to recount it and the sh chairman has shared this history. In the context of the 9-11 Commission report, the most immediate threat is not an incoming intercontinental ballistic missile, but an act of terror, some biological or chemical agent introduced in this country, or a dirty bomb delivered in a suitcase. Even our own intelligence agencies prioritize threats in this manner. And so the public has the right to ask, why is this administration spending more than $10 billion per year on a national missile defense system instead of protecting our ports, equipping the Coast Guard or our local first responders, protecting <laughs> chemical facilities or nuclear reactors, and so on down the line, the many things that need to be done which are underfunded seriously in the President's budget and in the majority's budget. The public has a right to an answer. Do experts and security personnel think this system will work? If the answer is no, 49 previous generals and admirals and other higher, retired military individuals speak out against deployment at this point in time. In a letter to the President, they clearly set out that, and I quote, as you have said, Mr. President, our highest priority is to prevent terrorists from acquiring and employing weapons of mass destruction. We agree. We therefore recommend as the militarily terribly responsible course of action that you postpone operational deployment of the expensive and untested GMD system and transfer the associated funding to accelerated programs to secure the multitude of facilities containing nuclear weapons and materials and to protect our ports and borders against terrorists who may attempt to smuggle weapons of mass destruction into the United States. In addition, 31 former government officials call the missile defense deployment a sham. These are officials who work for Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Carter, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Clinton, and argue that the missile defense system planned for rollout in September will provide no real defense, as they called it a sham. The officials worked at the Pentagon, the Department of State, National Security Council, Office of Management and Budget, Arms Control and Disarmament Agency, and their letter accused the administration of rushing a program into the field that is largely untested and missing major components. The fact of the matter is the public should know whether or not this president, for political purposes, is satisfying his ideological extremists by deploying an unproven, inadequately tested system, and in fact is he living in the past instead of addressing the concerns that we have of the 21st century. But instead of allowing for a public examination, this administration has classified relevant critical reports and facts, even reclassifying some that have been in the public domain for as much as four or five years. But what can be argued as political purposes? I won't go through the long rendition, Mr. Chairman, of the many letters that we started, but starting back in September 8th of the year 2000, this subcommittee held a hearing with the then Director of Operational Test and Evaluation, the Pentagon's own person, Phil Coyle, who testified about the inadequacies of the missile defense system. And at that time, I asked the subcommittee, and the subcommittee agreed without objection, to enter his report detailing 50 recommendations for how this system should be tested. And we put that in the public record. What occurred after that was a patent of stonewalling and repeated resistance from the Department of Defense that lasted over eight months. And finally, on May 31, 2001, the COIL report was delivered to Congress. As Mr. Kucinich mentioned, it was first marked for official use only. But when challenged, the Department of Defense was unable to respond what that category meant and certainly did not indicate that it was classified in any sense. Finally, Chairman Shays took the lead and decided to make this information available to the public on June 2001. It was on the website, it was in public documents, and since that point in time, we've had numerous hearings in this committee, had testimony from experts, had plasterboards set up with information on it, had it on our own websites, and sure enough, it w it finally I asked the General Accountability Office to prepare a report to tell us in September of 2004, what would the conditional deployment be, especially with respect to the 50 issues raised by Mr. Coyle. 
After fighting an inordinate period of time, the General Accountability Office was finally able to issue a report. It no sooner hit my desk than this administration classified that report. You can imagine for yourself whether it was a favorable report to their position or unfavorable. Not satisfied with that, we asked them to go back and look over every line and tell us what was classified and what was not. Having done that, they issued a classified report and an unclassified report. The unclassified report, in my estimation, was damning. You can imagine what the classified report was. But then the administration took the additional step of going back and reclassifying all of the previously open available information upon which those reports were based, none of them previously having been classified, all of the information having been in the public domain for some four years. You can answer the question probably better than I can, but why should this administration be trusted with the recommendation of the September 11 Commission to move toward a culture of need to share as opposed to need to know? But it's not all about the missile defense system. There's a disturbing pattern in this administration of using secrecy as a means to defend or advance their political purposes and policies. When confronted with allegations that the Energy Task Force, which the Vice President convened, was predominantly comprised of industry members who would be inclined to favor the status quo energy policy in this country, the Bush administration refused to come clean and disclose participants of the task force, arguing that such inquiries into federal agencies are off limits to the courts, the Congress, and thus the American people. In June of 2003, when the Environmental Protection Agency released a report on the state of the environment, the detailed assessment of climate change, which among other things was to conclude that carbon dioxide emissions are contributing to global warming, was deleted by the White House and replaced with language that was deliberately vague and disingenuous about the scientific causes of global warming. And after hearing the compelling evidence that defective tires on certain automobiles and the tragedies that ensued on Americans' roads, Congress passed a law making certain that auto safety data be made available to the public. But this administration's <clears throat> National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration has decided that such information regarding unsafe automobiles, which may be detrimental to their companies, will remain secret. And now, according to Friday's Washington Post, the Department of Justice in its court battle with the American Civil Liberties Union over portions of the Patriot Act has attempted to rely on secret evidence. As Mr. Kucinich also mentioned, one aspect of that was, in essence, censoring a dozen seemingly innocuous passages on national security grounds, including an attempt to redact a quotation from a 1972 Supreme Court ruling that simply said, and I quote, the danger to political dissent is acute where the government attempts to act under so vague a concept as the power to protect domestic security. Given the difficulty of defining the domestic security interest, the danger of abuse and acting protect to protect that interest becomes apparent. Now, there's a dangerous statement if ever I heard one. But this administration's Department of Justice thought that that had to be redacted from a court proceeding. This reliance on classification and withholding of information doesn't just prevent transparency and accountability in public policymaking. It is an act that is fundamentally opposed to the public. It's opposed to their health, to their civil liberties, to their consumer interest, and most importantly, to their safety. How can we trust that this administration, with this record, will commit itself to implementing the 9-11 Commission's recommendation that we have more transparency, that we move to a culture of sharing, a need to share versus a need to know, at a time when it's so important that we put our resources where the dangers appear most and not on some ideological extreme program that is unproven and untested. Hiding the facts is not doing this country any service, and we have to take the recommendation of the 9-11 Commission seriously, and I hope these hearings, Mr. Chairman, will move us in that direction of classifying only what needs to be classified and sharing the rest of the American people can make the right choices and the right priorities for our safety. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his statement. At this time, the chair would recognize Mr. Ruppersberger, who um, serves on the House Intelligence Committee. I appreciate his well, being here as well. First, Mr. Shea, I want to thank you. You know, we have a tremendous <coughs> opportunity at this time in our history to provide for national security as a result of what happened in 9-11. Uh, the, I want to first praise the Commission and all those people involved, including, including the, uh, the families of those who, who, who died uh, in the 9-11 incident. Uh, at this point, it's very, very important <clears throat> that we deal with this issue in a nonpartisan way. And it's important that we also understand that there are different elements we have to deal with as far as the 9-11 Commission's report. First, it's extremely important that we do have one person that can hold all the intelligence communities accountable. We have to make sure that the intelligence communities, all of them, including the, the military, DOD, CIA, NSA, all the intelligence communities <clears throat> work as a team and that they integrate the information. 
We can be extremely sophisticated in all of our intelligence community, but if we don't get to the bottom line and do what needs to be done and get the right information to the right people, we will not be successful in what, what is our goal of national security. Now, the issue that we're dealing with today is overclassification as a barrier to critical information. And I think it's extremely important that we deal with this issue. Uh, just one, one aspect of this overclassification over is also the barrier in getting people cleared and how ridiculous it is. I have a, a, a Federal Times, August 16th, 482,000 wait for clearance. Backlog on security checks holds up work, wastes billions of dollars. Now, one of the American intelligence community's greatest problems is the cult of classification, in which information, both rare and commonplace, is a safeguard with equal zeal. Both cases also illustrate the intense political pressures on intelligence and counterintelligence agencies, polluting the value of the nation's intelligence. These are part of our system that are broken, the ones that no one in Washington wants to talk about, but that we're going to have to deal with to fix this system. There's certainly vital information that must be protected from foreign espionage. These secrets worth saving should be held closely. Far too much effort is being wasted protecting non-secrets, which allows vital secrets to slip through. In Washington, classification has led to sort of a game, creating those in the know and those who are not in the know. This game heightens the power of bureaucrats, but so much is classified that it is impossible for people with security clearances to know what is derived from a spy satellite and what is plucked out of the newspaper, which is considered open source. So what is a secret? Nuclear secrets should be kept secret. The names of U.S. agents in other countries must be kept secret. Operational capabilities of U.S. weapons should be kept secret. Unlike today's situation, a secret requires that there not be the slightest hint that even a secret exists. To do that, the government would need to follow just a few simple rules instead of the maraud of complexities it has, had, it has erected. And whether it's a Democratic administration or Republican, there's not a consistency in what we do as far as this classification is concerned. And we need consistency. We need standards. First, there must be few secrets. Unless you are willing to stash people, it's easiest to keep a small number of secrets. Second, give secrets to fewer people. The idea of hundreds of thousands of people wandering around with secrets is absurd. Do not use access to classified materials as a justification for doing background checks on military officers. Just do background checks. Don't classify as secret that which is in the New York Times and on the Internet. Don't use secrecy as a shield to protect idiotic political and policy decisions. I'm looking forward to hearing what your recommendations would be to deal with this very important issue. It is a strong component of what we need to deal with to provide the best national security for our country. You know, intelligence clearly is the best defense against terrorism, but we need to get our system right, consistent, and focused. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, especially uh, your comments, given that you do serve on, on the Intelligence Committee. And, and just would say I appreciate the gentleman um, breaking a family vacation to be here. Um, I have the opportunity to ask the first questions. I'm going to defer to you to start off, and then we'll go to Mr. Kucinich, Mr. Cherney, and myself. I would uh, ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose and without objection so ordered. I ask further unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statement in the record and without objection so ordered. Uh, and I would, um, and I've, this is a fairly big document that, that I've shown the ranking member. It's entitled Dubious Secrets, a briefing book of overclassified documents prepared by the National Security Archive, George Washington University. And I'm going to ask that it be submitted into the record and without objection. And just note that the George Washington Archive maintains a body of documentation demonstrating the inconsistency and the arbitrariness of many classified decisions. They find documents released by one agency classified in whole or in part by another. And they, they track a declassification process they find to be extraordinarily slow and litigious. So without objection, we will put that in the record. And at this time, I'll recognize um, our witnesses. Uh, we have Mr. William Leonard, Director, Information Security Oversight Office, National Archives and Records Administration. We have Carol Hav, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Counterintelligence and Security, Department of Defense. 
We have Mr. Stephen Aftergood, Federation of American Scientists, and Mr. William uh, P. Crowell, uh, Crowell the, uh, the Markle Foundation Task Force on National Security in the Information Age. We have uh, uh, truly four experts on this issue. It's not an easy issue to deal with. And uh, uh, given we have one panel, um, you know, we'll have the five minutes that you may speak. You can trip over a little bit. I just assume you not take another five minutes, but you would have that, that right. Uh, and then we'll go to 10-minute questioning. Um, and at this time, I'd ask you to stand as you know, we swear in all our witnesses. Let me ask you, is there anyone else that's accompanied you that might provide information, therefore I, you would want them to stand so that they could be sworn in this time? Is there anyone else? No one else? Okay. Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I know for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. And uh, at this time, um, we'll uh, begin with you, Mr. Leonard. Thank you for being here. Is your mic on, sir? It should kind of show up as a green light. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Kucinich, members of the panel. I wish to thank you for holding this hearing on security classification and declassification issues. As director of the Information Security Oversight Office, I am responsible to the President for overseeing the government-wide classification program both within government and industry. Executive Order 12958, as amended, sets forth the basic framework by which executive branch agencies classify national security information. Pursuant to his constitutional authority, in this order, the President authorizes a limited number of individuals to apply classification to certain national security-related information. While the order is clear that the employment of classification is based in large part upon the judgment of an original classifying authority, in delegating classification authority, the President has established clear parameters for its use and certain burdens that must be satisfied. Classification authority is not without limits. The President has spelled out some very clear prohibitions with respect to the use of classification. Specifically, in no case can, class can information be classified in order to conceal violations of law or prevent embarrassment to a person, an organization, or an agency. Unfortunately, there have been instances giving the impression that information has been classified in violation of the order. In each case I'm aware of, I have found that this often arises due to lack of proactive oversight within agencies and a lack of effective training and awareness provided to some cleared personnel. I believe that the overall policy for security classification as set forth in the current executive order is fundamentally sound while I and others, to include the 9-11 Commission, have advocated revisions to basic concepts such as the need-to-know principle, the order as currently configured is replete with measures to ensure the classification system's continued effectiveness. Many agencies are excelling at fulfilling these requirements, others are not. It's no secret that the government classifies too much information. Many senior officials will candidly acknowledge the problem of excessive classification. This is supported in part by agency input to my office that indicates that overall classification activity is up over the past several years. What I find most troubling, however, is that some individual agencies have no idea how much information they generate is classified, whether the overall quantity is increasing or decreasing, what the explanations are for such changes, which elements within their organizations are most responsible for the changes, and most importantly of all, whether the changes are appropriate. The identification of baseline information such as this is essential for agencies to be able to ascertain the effectiveness of their classification efforts. My current concerns extend to the area of declassification as well. It's, important to, it's disappointing to note that the declassification activity has been down for the past several years. In some quarters, when it comes to classification in times of national security challenges, when available resources are distracted elsewhere, the approach toward classification and declassification can be to err on the side of caution. Yet the classification system is too important, and the consequences resulting from improper implementation too severe to allow error to be the part of any implementation strategy. Both too little and too much classification is not an option. Too much classification unnecessarily impedes effective information sharing and inappropriate classification undermines the integrity of the entire process. 
Too little classification can subject our citizens, our democratic institutions, our homeland security, and our interactions with foreign nations to potential harm. Proactive oversight by agencies of their security classification program and involvement by senior leadership is crucial. The security classification system is permissive, not prescriptive. It identifies what information can be classified, not what information must be classified. The decision to classify information or not is ultimately the prerogative of an agency and its original classification authorities. The problem, however, with all due apologies to John Dunn, is that no agency is an island. The exercise of agency prerogative to classify certain information has ripple effects throughout the entire executive branch as well as the nation as a whole. It can serve as an impediment to sharing information with another agency or with the public who have a genuine need to know for the information. The 9-11 Commission has recommended that information uh, procedures should provide incentives for sharing to restore a better balance between security and shared knowledge. The administration is currently developing guidelines and regulations to improve information sharing both among federal departments and agencies and between the federal government and state and local entities. On August 2nd of this year, President Bush announced that he will be issuing a directive requiring all relevant agencies to complete the task of adopting common databases and procedures so that intelligence and homeland security information can be shared and searched effectively, consistent with privacy and civil liberties. I thank you for inviting me here today, Mr. Chairman. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you or the subcommittee may have. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Uh, Ms. Hav. Good morning, Chairman Shays, Mr. Kucinich, and members of the panel. I appreciate the chance to speak with you today about the protection of classified information within the Department of Defense. My opening statement will be brief, as I believe the time we have here can best be spent in direct dialogue. Protection of classified information is one of the most important priorities of the department. No one wants to provide information outside of proper channels that would do our servicemen and women, as well as our civilian coworkers, harm. Nor does anyone want to give away what is our economic and military advantage by providing information about advanced science and technology, sources or methods of our operations. The question becomes, how do we balance the risk of disclosure and its often incalculable consequences against the public's desire to know? The issue before us today is overclassification and whether it is an impediment to information sharing. I have not found within the Department of Defense that people are intentionally overclassifying. That's not to say that it doesn't and isn't happening. More what I've found is that these problems stem from time-driven operational circumstances and a misunderstanding of classification guidance. In the end, people simply don't want to make mistakes that can have both personal and national security consequences. Does this impact information sharing? Sometimes it does. We in DOD are working to ensure our policies are clear about when and how to classify information, as well as ensuring personnel know and understand their responsibilities in sharing with those who must have the information. Much data that is transported on DOD networks is protected by classification guidance provided by other government organizations. We adhere to that guidance, but we certainly can improve the way we do it. For example, how do we deal with originator-controlled documents in an electronic environment? The 21st century is about information technology. It is about the seamless availability of information across security domains consistent with a governance strategy that ensures people are properly vetted and trained. The collectors of information, and also normally the original classifiers, can never know the myriad ways that their information might be used for good purpose. Therefore, we have to migrate to a user-driven environment to support true competitive intelligence, to ensure the warfighters and policymakers have the information that they need to make good decisions, and to mutually support other organizations and agencies in successfully accomplishing their missions as well. We must break down the functional stovepipes and institutional barriers in favor of a more horizontally integrated, collaborative enterprise characterized by cooperation and incentivized shared goals. We must make better use of all source analysis to blur the, to blur the origin of information and write to release using automated tear lines. 
need to know while still a valid concept that drives information security must now also include the need to share information more broadly at multiple classification levels as well as in the unclassified public domain. Technology is not the problem. The technology we need is here today or is being developed. And there are any number of initiatives that are moving us collectively in the right direction. Instead, I would offer that the problem is institutional and cultural, and no agency or organization is immune. Change is always difficult, and fear of making a mistake precludes people from moving forward in ways that are consistent with technology and business process improvements. In the end, this is a discussion about risk. How much risk is the na nation willing to endure in the quest to balance protection against the public's desire to know? It's a complex question that requires thought and ultimately action. The Department of Defense has been taking that action with respect to information that it alone controls. As stated in my formal statement, the Department has embraced a network-centric enterprise with common standards and protocols and a robust information assurance and protection schema. But this architecture and enterprise are not cheap, and when extended to other government as well as state, local, and other organizations, the costs are high. We are working closely with the intelligence community, Department of Homeland Security, and others to extend the enterprise to facilitate the collaboration and cooperation that the public deserves, and we are better for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hav. Um, Mr. Aftergood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think your mic is on, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was going to begin by attempting to document for you the, the state of the classification system as it is perceived from outside the government. Um, I was going to explain to you that classification policy is often arbitrary, inconsistent, that classifiers sometimes classify contrary to their own rules. Sometimes, as in the case of the Taguba report, they use classification to conceal criminal activity and that the classification system is, is in other ways unsatisfactory. I've documented some of those rather serious charges in my formal testimony. I know from your opening statements that, that all of you already are aware of many of these problems. Um, I can do it very quickly. I would like to be part of the public record. Um, and so, um, you know, you have, you have the time to do it. Thank and you, then, Mr. And, Chairman. And in the course of your presenting these documents, it gives us something to question everybody with. Okay, I will, I will, I will do that briefly. So we're going to start the clock over again. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I think that uh, the witness ought to feel very comfortable in going over this material with this committee, and we eagerly await your recitation of your report. Thank you very much. Um, I, I've selected, not quite at random, but, but uh, across a representative spectrum of, of, of cases that have come into my hands, several anomalies in classification policy. The recent Senate intelligence report on pre-war intelligence on Iraq included um, abundant redactions, that is, uh, uh, removals of information from the report. Uh, that in some cases were inconsistent or inexplicable. On one page attached to my testimony, uh, it was stated that Iraqi agents agreed to pay up to a deleted amount for certain aluminum tubes. This is a point of controversy uh, regard having to do with Iraq's nuclear weapons program. But on another page of the same report, CIA reviewers included the very same information. Iraqi agents agreed to pay up to $17.50. Um, at a minimum, this is inconsistent. Uh, uh, it shows a lack of professionalism in classification. But more than that, I, I think it shows an improper attempt to withhold information that has no business being classified. Obviously, the Iraqis know what they paid. The vendors know what they paid. They know that we know. There's nothing sensitive that is being uh, with concealed here, but it held up the release of the report and it, it, it helped turn it into a kind of Swiss cheese. Uh, a second example is the, the Taguba report on abuses of prisoners at Abu Ghraib prison in, uh, in Iraq. As you can see from the title page of the report, which is also appended to my testimony, the whole report was classified secret. 
That is, the secret classification level means that its disclosure could reasonably be expected to cause serious damage to national security. If you look at page 16 of the report, you can see that several individual paragraphs of the report were also classified secret. Such things as a finding that numerous incidents of sadistic, blatant, and wanton criminal abuses were inflicted on detainees. Punching, slapping, and kicking detainees, jumping on their naked feet, and so on. These individual findings were classified secret. That is not only inappropriate, it actually is a violation of the rules governing the classification system itself. Those rules state in President Bush's executive order that in no case shall information be classified in order to conceal violations of law. Yet it appears that that is exactly what happened here. When agencies violate their own classification rules, one thing that tells you is that oversight is inadequate. A third example that I, that I, that I pulled for my written statement uh, is to me the, the, the most extreme example of overclassification. And that has to do with the CIA's insistence on classifying historical intelligence budget data. In 1997 and 1998, the CIA declassified, under pressure of litigation, the total intelligence budget for those years, for 97 and 98. But in 2000, they said that similar information from 50 years earlier is still properly classified. Um, to, to state the obvious, that is, an, that is a logically incoherent position. There is no national security construct that permits the declassification of the 1997 budget, but prohibits the declassification of the 1947 budget. Um, what that tells me is that the CIA has completely lost its bearings when it comes to classification of budget information, and that there's no one to stop them from arbitrary and mistaken classification actions. There are many other examples. Um, the document you entered into the record, Mr. Chairman, Dubious Secrets from the National Security Archive is filled with, with other cases. I, I imagine that anyone who has uh, had dealings with the national security system, either as a government employee or as a concerned citizen, has their, their own horror stories to tell. Uh, certainly, the, the public is increasingly becoming concerned I'm a member of the steering committee of a new coalition of uh, politically diverse organizations under the rubric OpenTheGovernment.org that is coming together to, to try to um, uh, remedy this situation. I would just like to say one final word about what is, in a way, the most important aspect of this hearing. That is, what's the solution? Uh, the solution is not... Um, uh, uh, a broad policy critique. I don't think the solution is a, uh, uh, to try to fix the whole system at a single blow. I think the solution was identified by the 9-11 Commission. That is, start with a very specific, tangible change. Start with declassification of intelligence budget information. There is no other category of information that has been as vigorously uh, maintained as secret for so long with so much energy as intelligence budget information. If we can fix that, then the road becomes clear to fixing a whole range of other erroneously or improperly classified categories of information. And that's the point I wanted to stress. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Eftgood. Uh, Mr. Cromwell. Crowell, I'm sorry. Crowell. Good I morning. Say, uh, I want to say it correctly. Is it Mr. Crowell? It's Crowell. Crowell. Uh, that's to avoid getting uh, confused with a certain admiral that I'm always confused with. Okay. <laughs> uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Shays, and Mr. Kucinich, uh, and members of the subcommittee. I would like to thank you for this opportunity uh, to testify this morning on recommendations that are made by the Markle Foundation Task Force on National Security in the Information Age. 
I think you will find that our observations are in agreement, Mr. Chairman, with your opening uh, statement of the problem. Uh, the Markle Foundation Task Force is seeking, though, to outline and propose a new strategy of information sharing that can benefit our war on terrorism. Information and information sharing are key to fighting terrorism and enhancing our security. Today, our government still does not have all of the information it needs to fight terrorism, and the information it does have is sometimes isolated in different agencies, and therefore it is more difficult to see its significance. While the discussion about how to implement the 9-11 uh, Commission's recommendation to restructure the intelligence community is important, another key 9-11 Commission recommendation that is creating and implementing a trusted information network to facilitate better information sharing among our intelligence and law enforcement organizations at the federal, state, and local area uh, levels could actually make America safer today. The 9-11 Commission embraced the recommendations for creation of a system-wide homeland analysis and resource exchange, uh, the acronym SHARE network, made last December by the Markle Foundation Task Force on National Security and in the Information Age. The Markle Foundation Task Force consists of leading national security experts from four administrations, as well as widely recognized uh, experts on technology and on civil liberties. The SHARE Network concept represents a virtual reorganization of government by fundamentally altering how people in the many organizations ask to fight terrorism, how they share information to facilitate better and faster decision making. Such an approach, when paired with strong guidelines that govern the system, is also the best way to protect privacy and civil liberties. The SHARE network is aimed at moving us from our current need-to-know system into the need-to-share culture that you've been describing. However, one of the barriers to enabling that move involves classification and information security practices. Decisions about sharing intelligence in the government today are still made largely in the context of a system of classification that was developed during the Cold War. During the Cold War, the use of information was dominated by a culture of classification and tight limitations on access in which information was shared only on a need-to-know basis. The current system assumes that it is possible to determine in advance who needs to know particular information and that the risk associated with disclosure are greater than the potential benefits of wider information sharing. The results of the incentives currently in place to protect information results and far more information being, uh, results in far more information being classified initially and remaining classified than is necessary or appropriate. Another problem with the current system is that each agency has its own classification practices, which leads to cultural tensions when agencies attempt to share information with each other. This Cold War mindset of classification, sanitization, and tight limits on sharing information is ill-suited to today's homeland security challenge. While certain information, particularly about sources and methods, must be protected against unauthorized disclosure, the general mindset should be one that strives for broad sharing of information with all of the relevant players in the network. The Market Markle Foundation Task Force approach is to develop new concepts of operation and to use new technology to achieve a sharing culture. The share network concept is a decentralized, loosely coupled, secure, and trusted network that sends information to and pulls information from all participants in the system. Such an approach empowers all participants, from local law enforcement officers to senior policy makers. Our approach combines policy and technical solutions to create a network that would substantially improve our ability to predict and pre prevent terrorist attacks. The SHARE network is based upon the right to share concept. By t uh, taking steps like creating terrorline reports, it moves us from a system based on classification to one that is based on authorization and encourages reports that contain the maximum 
possible amount of shareable information. In addition, SHARE would use existing technologies that can facilitate the sharing of sensitive information within appropriate uh, channels and with protections for privacy. Screening tools can be used to help the redaction process to create less classified report, reports and can also tell us when sensitive information is about to be sent to parties who lack the proper permission to receive it. To address the need for information about reliability of a source without having to rely on classified descriptions, we recommend the use of reputation meters, uh, similar to those that are used today to rate sellers um, in, uh, in eBay, uh, in formats, and also to use standard formats for intelligence documents. Auditing technology could be deployed to track the flow of information to different players and to record how the information is used, which could help deter leaks. Information rights management technologies, when combined with digital certificates, can also help by allowing agencies to create self-enforcing rules about who can have access to particular documents, how they can be used, and how long the documents can be viewed before access expires. Finally, information can be accompanied by clearer, more specific handling requirements and dissemin uh, dissemination limitations. Uh, in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, information sharing itself is not the goal. Rather, it is the means by which we can effectively enhance security and protect privacy by maximizing our ability to make sense of all of the available information. To accomplish this, particularly in fighting terrorism, we must shed our current Cold War need-to-know mentality and replace it with a culture based on need to share information, uh, need to share. Information security is a legitimate concern, but it can be appropriately addressed in the ways that I've outlined above. What is needed now is the leadership by both Congress and the President to get the information flowing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kroll. Uh, let me just make a, a few observations before uh, Mr. Ruppersberger begins the questions. And, and one is that I carry a basic view that when the executive branch gets more power, it must be accompanied with more legislative oversight. I also take the view that classification um, practices impede oversight uh, by Congress or the public. Um, I have read in my 17 years in Congress uh, confidential, in terms of the various classifications, confidential documents, secret documents, top secret documents, and then we have uh, compartmentalized with code word access and special access and so on. But much of what I've read under confidential or secret, and in some cases top secret, but not obviously as often, it's been information I've wondered why it has been classified. In a meeting I had with the uh, chairman of the commission, 9-11 uh, commission, uh, Governor Kane said to me his biggest surprise was sitting, reading hours of information, wondering why in the world was this classified. And just another observation that we, yesterday we were talking about fighting a network called Al Qaeda. Uh, we were told we need a human and a communication network. This was in public diplomacy. And I'm hearing today, you know, we need to break out of our stovepipes and have a data network. And it's just interesting that, that the word network keeps showing up. And, and to conclude my, my observation, uh, we have nearly 4,000 people classifying information, 14 million documents. But some of those documents could literally have been a book. Uh, they could be extensive. So I, even when I think of 14 million, it, the document could be a small, uh, you know, just bit of information, or it could just be uh, pages and pages and pages of information. So uh, in the end, I'm just left with what I'm interested in is, is learning what the solution is. That's my interest. And, and uh, we'll start with Mr. Ruppersberger. You have uh, 10 minutes. If you need to run over, we, we can be informal with this. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, Mr. Leonard, uh, in your opening statement, you said that each agency has its own classification criteria, but no agency is an island. Uh, this creates both confusion and inconsistency that impedes a necessary balance for national security and transparency, transparency in a democracy. My question is this. Do you believe a national security intelligence director would help to solve part of this problem, that that person would, 
if that person had the authority, both uh, budget, also budgetary control, uh, to implement the policies that are necessary, some of the recommendations in the 9-11 uh, Commission report, but especially as it deals with the issue we're talking about here today, over classification, making sure that what is classified needs to be classified and what is not is not. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, one thing I, I, I don't want to do is to, to uh, presuppose any particular outcomes, but let me, let me address, address it along these lines. I'm asking your opinion. I know that this is in debate now. The President has recommended a national security director. Uh, the issue of budgetary still is not there. We're trying to get information. Let me say this. The reason I'm asking these questions, and we're all here, is that we have an opportunity, I think now, to really do something very positive as it relates to our national security and intelligence. And it's very important that, based on your expertise, we get your opinion. Yes, sir. I know you're not speaking uh, for the administration, but I'm asking from your expertise what your opinion would be as far as a national security director, as far as the budgetary issue is concerned, so that that person might be able to implement what we're talking about here today. Yes, sir. Let me address it along these lines. W one of the most significant challenges we have, I think, in this area is, is that we do have a basic framework for classification, as I mentioned. But superimposed upon that are multiple variations of the system, which are all designed to achieve the same end. So, for example, currently the DCI has its own unique authorities with respect to protecting sources and methods. The Secretary of Energy has his own unique authorities with respect to protecting atomic energy information. The Director of NSA has his own unique authorities with respect to protecting uh, communication security information. The Secretary of Defense has his own unique authorities with respect to protecting NATO-related information. And the list goes on and on and on and on. Those variations are, I think, significant impediments to information sharing. Uh, when it comes to protecting information, I, I see it as a binary state. Either it's protected or it isn't protected. And, and we have all these variations on the system that have minor nuances and differences in terms of how we protect information, how we credit systems, how we mark them, and things along those lines. If, if a single individual had the authority, had the authority to overcome the statutory, the existing statutory and regulatory authority that allows uh, multiple agencies to come up with their own nuances and variations on the system, yes, I think that would be a good In thing, sir. In your opinion, sir. do you feel that that person would need budgetary control also of those agencies? Um, let's put it this way, uh, Congressman. Uh, it's one thing to have the authority to, uh, to uh, write regulations. There always has to be um, um, consequences for, for noncompliance with regulations. I find uh, budgetary authority is one of the best means in which to get people's attention with respect to compliance or noncompliance with regulations. It kind of gives you the, the power to do what you need to do, I guess. Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay. Um, Mr. Afterhood, I, uh, there was an intelligence open hearing, I believe, <clears throat> last week or the week before, where they talked about the, the um, intelligence budget. And you addressed that in your testimony as far as uh, whether or not that need to, to be public. And I think there, there's a, a bipartisan consensus that there is a lot in the intelligence budget that could be made public. But there also was a concern that some of that should not be made public. And I think, you know, in, in your report, you, you seem as if the whole budget. I would be concerned that line by line could be very dangerous to both our military and to some of our CIA people or NSA people throughout the world. Could you, you give me your opinion on whether or not you think that the whole budget should, should be uh, out front and open or whether or not it should be discriminated? I mean, we should focus on the areas which could cause um, some type of problem to our, our people who are fighting and working for our national security. Yes, sir. Um, I do believe that there, there are portions of the intelligence budget that should remain classified. Um, I would be guided by the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, which said that the total, the top line number, <coughs> as well as the, <coughs> excuse me, as well as the individual agency budget totals should be made public, but, but nothing beyond that. I think that's a reasonable middle ground that would uh, provide oversight. It would break the, the, the log jam of secrecy in this area but it would keep sensitive programs protected. Okay. I'm going to ask, I don't know how long I'll have, it's a broad question to the whole panel, but the 9-11 Commission endorsed the creation of a decentralized, technologically advanced trusted information network to make threat information more widely accessible and to reverse Cold War paradigms and cultural biases against information sharing. 
Now, the Commission noted that such a network had been described in a task force report commissioned by the Markle Foundation, Mr. Crow Crow um, <clears throat> but the concept has not yet been converted into action. My question to the whole panel, if we have time, and I know it's a broad question, but I'd like your point of view. What would you recommend to Congress uh, as to how you would start to implement the changes that need to be, be done to, in order to effectuate the issue that we're talking about here today? Overclassification, need to know. I mean, we, there are many <clears throat> issues that need to be classified, no question. But we have a tremendous amount of volume. We have a, a lot of agencies. I mean, part of the problem in intelligence is just getting this enormous amount of volume on internet and all th that we get, and then analyzing it and then getting to the right people so they can implement and use it to protect our national security. How would you now, because again, remember, we have an opportunity now. We're focused on this, the country's focused. How would you begin to implement the changes that need to be, be, to be made? You want to start with Mr. Crowell? Crowell and Crow, and then go down that way. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, start by saying that we have just concluded a plenary session at uh, the Aspen Institute in uh, Aspen, Colorado, in which we were addressing the very issue you raised, which is what are the next steps for implementing a shared concept uh, network? Um, it's a very difficult problem, and it's a very long um, uh, uh, kind of effort because it's a very large undertaking. We believe that uh, it begins with uh, legislation that would um, e essentially outline the kind of network that uh, the Congress would like to see uh, based upon some of the principles which I will very briefly uh, describe. Uh, and that the, the President then put together the cross-agency kind of implementing uh, process that is necessary uh, because once you begin working across agencies, funding and management of large undertakings like this become very, very difficult and very complex. Uh, all of this to be done with a short deadline uh, so that we can uh, move this along using existing technology, not inventing new technologies. Um, we, we think that this concept can be fleshed out. I'd like to just add before I mention the characteristics of the network that, that the larger problem uh, in trying to achieve the balance that was described earlier uh, is to not only have a network which encourages sharing but also to have the kinds of guidelines and policy that encourage sharing, that we train people in sharing concepts and in classification concepts, and that we have metrics and auditing capabilities so we can see whether or not they're following the policy and guidance. You need standards. You need standards. Yes, and we need uh, uh, standards. We need compliance enforcement, both for protecting information that needs to be protected, but also for sharing information that will benefit uh, the, public, uh, the public good. Um, just one last quick thing. Some of the concepts that we believe are important uh, then are concepts that uh, have flexible access controls, authentication, authorization, so people trust the system, uh, that they have a publish and subscribe capability in which people can say, I want to be able to get certain kinds of information to assist me in doing my mission or to assist me in doing my analysis, and they will get it. Uh, that it be a distributed system in which it's a system of systems. You don't build it centrally and manage it centrally from some place in the U.S. federal government. There's a longer list. Yeah, I, I understand. We have other flavor. witnesses. We, uh, I, I just <clears throat> want to make sure that we understand um, that we have done so much in identifying the problem. Let's get to the impl implementation. My yellow light has gone on, so the quicker you can go, but I probably won't be able to ask you any more questions. So, um, Very quickly, a couple points. The problem will never be fixed. It'll never be over. It will always require continuing oversight, continuing refinement. Um, uh, therefore, I would say don't attempt to do too much. Do attempt to get the process started. Uh, the other point I would just like to mention quickly is when I hear trusted information network, um, I get concerned that um, the, when barriers go down between agencies, they're going up between the government and the public. So I would say, Keep in mind the question of public access. 
keep in mind the option of, um, uh, of allowing a way for the public to gain access to information that it needs sometimes. But I would say this. We always sometimes have a tendency to overreact, and we still have to keep our eye on the ball and make sure that that information, which could be very dangerous to this country or to the people working for this country, needs to be classified. And, and really, there's an issue that hasn't been discussed, and I think if you can't trust the people with the information, then they shouldn't be in that position. Say. The first thing that we have to do is to ensure that people are properly classifying information. And what you find is where there are seams, there's friction. So as you're trying to create a trusted information network that spans the different government agencies, local, state, uh, et cetera, what we need are common standards and protocols. For example, the Department of Defense and CIA have recently come to agreement on a metadata standard. Metadata is important so that computers can do for us what, we, what takes us a long time to do, and that is parse information with respect to security classifications in a way that people get the information that they're entitled to and not information that they're not. Um, Cross-domain security systems that allow accreditation across domains, not necessarily making one generic network, but having separate networks where the cross-domain security, that governance strategy, is already mandated and agreed to by all will facilitate that movement of information across uh, the network. There are a number of things that we can do, uh, automated tear lines, et cetera. And I think we are down the path of looking at doing all of those things. The DCI runs an information sharing working group. There are a number of congressionally directed actions that we are looking at with respect to that. And we are making progress towards that. In the end, however, what it requires is that all of us come together with the common standards and protocols to facilitate that sharing. And uh, that's an issue that's above any one department. Very quickly, sir, the one, one thing I would uh, recommend being addressed is, is, as I alluded to before, the, the issue of unique agency uh, prerogatives, especially those that are legislatively based. We currently have what I refer to as a patchwork quilt of various information protection and, and sharing regimes, not just in the classified arena, but in the unclassified arena as well. We have literally dozens of, of, unclassif uh, of protection regimes for controlled unclassified information many of which that date back to the, uh, to the Cold War that we've never revisited, and we add to them every year. We have now have controlled uh, critical infrastructure protected information. We have uh, sensitive security information in the transportation field. We have sensitive homeland security information. All these are, are unique uh, 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 regimes that are being created and ru unique rules are being written that will definitely impede when people then try to fuse all these various types of information in, in, in a networked environment. Thank you, Chair. Thank the gentleman. At this time, the Chair would recognize Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much. I would first uh, like to uh, speak to the testimony of Mr. Aftergood. Uh, in part three of your testimony, you speak of the classification of historic, historical intelligence budget data, and you also get into the discussion um, which uh, Mr. Ruppersberger alluded to about whether or not intelligence budgets ought to be classified. The, um, this is not a, an arcane question or one that actually can be left solely to the Department of Defense or the Central Intelligence Agency. This is a constitutional matter. We take oaths not to defend the CIA or the Defense Department. We take an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States. So to provide an appropriate frame for this discussion, let me cite Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 of the Constitution, quote, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of all public money shall be published from time to time, unquote. The Constitution of the United States makes it very clear that you can't have secret budgets. Our founders anticipated 
that the only way to protect a democracy was to have it be open and that we know exactly how the taxpayers' money is being spent. Now, I alluded at the beginning of this hearing to a book called uh, the, Sour the, the Sorrows of Empire by Chalmers Johnson. Here's what he says about this article, about Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 of the Constitution. He says, quote, this article is one that empowers Congress and makes the United States a democracy. It guarantees the people's representatives will know what the state apparatus is actually doing, and it authorizes full disclosure of these activities. It has not been applied to the Department of Defense or the Central Intelligence Agency since their creation. Instead, there's been a permanent policy of, quote, don't ask, don't tell, unquote. The White House has always kept the intelligence agency's budget secret, and deceptions in the budget day, uh, defense budget date back to the Manhattan Project of World War II and the secret decisions to build atomic bombs and use them against the Japanese. In 1997, then-Senator Robert Torricelli, a Democrat of New Jersey, proposed an amendment to the 1998 Defense Authorization Bill requiring that Congress disclose aggregate intelligence expenditures. He lost, but he was able to make the point that the intelligence agencies spend more than the combined gross national products of North Korea, Libya, Iran, and Iraq, and they do so in the, in the name of the American people without any advice or supervision from them. End of quote from uh, Chalmers Johnson. Now, I, I want to go a little bit more into this discussion, Mr. Aftergood. What about this? I mean, we, we're talking about something that, that is key to the survival of our democracy, are we not? Uh, we are talking about fundamental principles. It's easy to look at this and think, oh, this is a detail. Who really cares anyway? It is a fundamental principle. Budget disclosure is one of only two categories of government information whose publication is required by the Constitution. And as you correctly say, government officials don't take oaths to particular agencies. They take oaths to uphold and defend the Constitution. Uh, in, in this area, uh, most government officials have been derelict. I would add that it's not simply the White House. It's not simply the Bush administration. It's the Clinton administration. It's past administrations. It's the Congress. The last time the matter was voted on in the Congress in 1997, majorities in both the House and Senate voted against budget disclosure. I consider it a serious lapse. Now, I should say that the Constitution doesn't say that everything must be open and must be published right now. It says it must be published from time to time. And that allows the possibility that, uh, uh, that things could remain secret for a period of time. But when the CIA says that 50-year-old intelligence budgets must remain secret, that tells me that they are acting in bad faith. When the Justice Department defends the CIA, as they are doing now, in Freedom of Information Act litigation against having to disclose such historical information, that tells me they are also acting in bad faith and not in accord with constitutional values. Thank you. I want to move on to, uh, is it uh, Ms. Hobb? Hobb. Hobb, okay. Today's headlines, Washington Post, Iraqi teens abused at Abu Ghraib report finds, officials say inquiry. Uh, also confirms prisoners were hidden from aid groups. The article goes on to um, uh, say, among other things, that speaking on the condition of anonymity because the report's not been released, other officials at the Pentagon say the investigation also acknowledges that military intelligence soldiers kept multiple detainees off the record books and hid them from international humanitarian organizations. Now, uh, Ms. Hobb, there have been several examples given today of instances where the Department of Defense has acted questionably in classifying information. These include large sections of the Senate Intelligence Committee's report on Iraq's WMD program and the report of General Taguba on Abu Ghraib prison. Did your office make the decisions to classify those reports? Sir, my office did not make those decisions. Original classification authorities make those decisions as documents are being prepared. The review for security declassification is also made by the original classifying authority. Now, this morning's post that I just pointed out to you points that uh, the, you have several of these new reports on the Abu Ghraib prison abuse. They're near completion. 
this one report by General, Major General Fay describes the use of dogs to attack and frighten detainees, including Iraqi teenagers. So let me just ask you for the record. Will this report be made public, unclassified and whole? And what about the report of the Independent Commission led by former Defense Secretary James Schlesinger that is also pending? Sir, I am not seeing uh, Mr. Schlesinger's report, so I can't answer that question. Uh, with respect to the Taguba report, for example, I know that there were places where information was classified and there were other places in the report where that same information was not classified. There is a security review being undertaken today. It should be done in the next couple of weeks. And so that security review and its results will be made uh, available to you. The, with respect to the uh, General Fay report, uh, I also have, have not seen that report in its entirety. I think large portions of it are unclassified. But again, I have asked, as a result of the interest in these reports, that the original classifying authorities go back and review and be sure that they are classifying properly those por portions of the report that are classified, if they are. Have you ever been involved in uh, keeping things classified as a way of protecting the administration from any embarrassment? Sir, I have not. Uh, now, these instances that we just discussed didn't, you know, just occur recently or in regard to operations in Iraq. Uh, Mr. Tierney pointed out earlier, and he and I had had the opportunity to work together on uh, the issues relating to the testing at the Department of Defense how uh, you had results withheld from this committee for eight months uh, relating to the uh, planned national missile program. And the report and all 50 recommendations it made were then reclassified, though the report had been publicly available and disseminated before. Do you have any idea why this was done? Sir, I don't. I only just learned of this instance uh, yesterday when my staff brought it to my attention. What I am willing to do, however, is to go back and review it, pull the information as best I can, and uh, have a conversation with you about what the results are after I do an independent assessment. I know that's not probably satisfying to you, but I really uh, how long have you been How long have you been involved in this uh, particular assignment that you have? Uh, in this assignment as a deputy under uh, for about one year, sir, and then prior to that I was a deputy assistant secretary for counterintelligence, for security and information. And are, are you familiar with the uh, challenges which this committee made to the administration over gaining access and public release of materials with respect to the missile defense program? Sir, not always. Um, typically what happens in the Is that a yes or a no? Sometimes I am, for example, with respect to Abu Ghraib right now, I am aware of those things. With respect to missile defense, what happens is that the original classification authority, which in, the case, in this case is probably the Missile Defense Agency, would handle those. I would not necessarily be apprised of those. Do you, do you have any oversight over them at all? Do you look at their classification decisions? We do, look at the, we do have oversight over the department. Um, most of that is conducted at multiple levels decentrally, and so they have a, a responsibility to assure that their people are po uh, properly trained. They have a responsibility to um, conduct self-inspections and to report. We often uh, will answer questions for them, and we sometimes go and visit. You know, I Mr. cannot remember the last time that we uh, had a conversation on this subject with the Mass Missile Defense Agency. Mr. Chairman, the, the question that I think needs to be asked here is that who has the final word on classification? I mean, you can, you can chase this thing around uh, a tree forever. Who has the final word on classification, let's say, on a missile defense program? Who has it, you don't have, do you have the final word or don't you? No, sir. The Missile Defense Agency has the final word, uh, to the best of my knowledge. What we have done inside the department that is a recent change, for example, with respect to the habeas uh, cases at Guantanamo, is that we have convened a group of people, for example, from Guantanamo, from SOUTHCOM, from the Office of the Secretary of Defense, in order to uh, take on these classification, declassification issues. And where there are uh, impasses, where people cannot come to agreement, those things will now be, be brought forward to me and I will make the final de uh, classification decision. That is new in the Department of Defense. This time the Chair would recognize Mr. Tierney.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Hav, I don't mean to, uh, to pick on you, but I do want to follow up on this line of uh, thoughts. I, I, first of all, I'm grateful for your offer to look at that information and get back to us. Uh, I presume you'll do that within a week or two? Yes, sir, I will. All right, thank you. I'll tell you why. I mean, I think the public needs confidence that this classification system is not being used for political purposes, that it's not being used to demonize somebody or to avoid embarrassment. Uh, we have serious issues here, and they are how we're going to apportion our resources whether we're going to apportion them fighting the, the Cold War and looking backwards with a national missile defense system that's unproven and untested, or whether we're going to apply our resources to the most immediate threat according to our own intelligence agencies and almost every other independent uh, body that has looked at what our needs are at this point in time. You heard my rendition already of how we've pressed this matter. Uh, and I, I want you to know that Mr. Waxman, who's the ranking member of the full committee of government reform, and I sent a letter as far back as March 25th of this year. March 25th to the Secretary Rumsfeld objecting to his reclassification of already public information as well as his classification of a report based on that. And essentially telling him that, you know, this is important information. What he's doing is preventing a public debate on this. We can always debate whether that's a system that's necessary or not, uh, but we do need a debate on whether or not it should be going to the field unproven, untested, how much money we're going to spend or how we're going to spend $10 billion. Uh, and that's something that the American people need confidence that those decisions are being made. He has not responded yet, so you should know we can give you a copy of that letter. But since March 25th, they haven't had any hesitation of going forward and, and saying that they're going to deploy this system and making a big political halibut about it uh, for those they're interested in satisfying, but they haven't found time to respond to what I think are very legitimate instances. Let me share with you one other aspect you may want to investigate when you look at this. Theodore Postel is a professor of science and technology and national security at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. At one point in time, he wrote a letter to the White House that described how the Missile Defense Agency had doctored results of the National Missile Defense Test to hide the fact that they could not tell the difference between simple decoys and warheads. He described how the agency had altered its entire test program to hide that flaw. Subsequently, two General Accountability Office reports issued in March uh, of the, uh, 2002 verified the facts that he had written about to the White House. The way the agency responded to that was by claiming that it was classified. And what it did beyond that was it then sent three agents, three agents to deliver a letter to Mr. Postel that was classified as secret. The letter contained nothing more than publicly available information deemed classified by the government, in his words, so that the agency could claim that he would be violating security agreements if he continued to speak on the matter of national security. That's pretty extraordinary. That's going to pretty extreme lengths. And that's just not a matter of oversight with somebody making a bad decision about that. That's a conscious decision to try and muzzle somebody who had very specific and worthwhile information for the public to know and for us to make determinations on how we're going to allocate our resources. So I hope you'll also look into that matter. We can send you some information on that. Will you do that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I mean, that, uh, that should make every American concerned about just how these decisions are being made. So with that in mind, and I note, you know, uh, Mr. Aftergood, you had a very nice thought in your report that Congressional oversight is necessary and important, but you say it need not be arduous or elaborate undertaking. It can be as simple as posing a question to the Pentagon. That's not so. Mm. All right. We have been posing this question you know, for years and getting stonewalled on it. So I think what we might discuss here is beyond the nice side, that's the way government should work and that's the way we'd like this administration to work. They clearly are not working that way given the lengths which they'd go to get Mr. Postel quieted and the fact that we haven't had a letter answer from March 25th and it took us since uh, 2000 to get this information first in the public domain and then reclassified. What's a better way for congressional oversight? And that's the, the question I pose to each of the members of the panel. After you know, we have the, uh, the challenge or the, or the classification determination made within the administration by the Interagency Security Classification Appeals Panel, ICECAP, uh, which is nothing more than executive officers uh, looking it over and although they've had a pretty good record of ordering some, some declassification, it's not 100 percent, when they don't agree with the public, when the public raises a question about reclassification and, and asks for declassification, where do they go? What should be Congress's role? How do we get some decent oversight that sticks to what we're trying to do here and not go beyond that? And, and Mr. Leonard, I'll start with you and maybe go left to right. If I understand your, your, your question correctly, sir, is where, where would the public go after, for example, uh, they well, get an unsatisfactory answer? Well, there's a Congress that says we would like to have this declassified. The executive says no. Then you tell Mr. Aftergood's uh, recommendation, send a nice letter saying please reconsider and let us know what your thoughts are, and, and they basically send you off into ether space somewhere. 
Uh, basically, uh, uh, pursuant to the order, uh, right now, you, you've identified the, the, one of the two primary routes individuals have. One is to go uh, uh, through the courts, uh, through the uh, Freedom of Inform Information Act process. The and other what's is the record been on that? Is there is anybody familiar with any court not my, saying my, that? My, that my, my, my understanding is that almost without exception, the courts will always defer to the executive branch. Exactly. And uh, the other uh, pr process that you alluded to that's provided for in the executive order uh, is to go to this administrative appeals process to this interagency group, which uh, does have at least somewhat of a more uh, favorable record with respect to releasing the information. My experience has been is that when a group of agency representatives uh, get together rather than just the, the owner of the information, you get a less parochial view of the, of the situation, a more holistic assessment. And I believe uh, off the top of my head, the, the historical record is, is that approaching 60 some odd percent of the time, uh, the panel will, will override an agency's determination in whole or in part. But my, my question, I appreciate that uh, account of that, but now we get to the point where in instances the decision back to the petitioner, whether it be a member of Congress or a member of the public in general, is unsatisfactory. Congress should have a role to play here, and I, that's our oversight responsibility. We've had hearings here, and we're getting stonewalled left and right. So you're saying that our only response to this is subpoena uh, and beat it out of them, in and, and that sense of the word. There ought to be, there to be some statutory change. What's your opinion of where we should go from here? Uh, the, um, the challenge there is that, by and large, the, uh, the exercise of classification authority is primarily, is, has, has primarily been pursuant to the President's constitutional Article II authorities. And that, of course, would complicate any sort of um, legislative remedy with respect, to, uh, with respect to ultimate decisions along those lines. So you say nowhere, we're stuck. Uh, I, 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 believe, I do believe that there can be more responsive means by which to resolve disputes. Uh, I believe the ice cap process uh, can be enhanced. Oh. I believe. How would you do that? Uh, um, one, one of my concerns is the ice cap process right now is primarily, and I'm not trying to be disparaging here, but it has, is primarily a hobby horse for, uh, for historical researchers. And, uh, and again, that's important that they get that kind of information. But I believe that process can be used for more relevant, more timely uh, information as well. And I believe it can be stepped up, possibly with, uh, with some sort of uh, t um, uh, specific time limitations for action and with consequences if action is not taken. For example, absent of a decision, such and such would occur. Uh, those types of, uh, of uh, remedies at least uh, pro uh, provide for a responsiveness and provide for some consequences if, uh, if attention and, and resources are not devoted to that topic. Ms. Hobbs, since that's a presidential executive order, uh, would you recommend to the president that he take that kind of action and step it up, as uh, Mr. Leonard says, or what would be your remedy for Congress and the American public? I think there are a number of things that we can do that, is, that are different from how we've been doing this in the past. The first step I just described within the Department of Defense for this limited uh, classification review for these reports. But that's not to say that we shouldn't put in place a process whereby that information uh, comes to me or comes to whoever sits in my position or in a different position as, as decided by the secretary and is an adjudicator uh, within the department. And that may, in fact, facilitate and speed some of the uh, questions and answers that you appear to want. Um, I think the ice cap could, in fact, be uh, expanded a bit beyond its typical historical base to, to do those kinds of adjudications when the Congress is, is feeling that it's not getting the information that it needs. Uh, on that committee sit representatives from each of the agencies. We review the information that's in question. We research it. We make our decisions. And that could, in fact, for your information, be provided to you. Is my uh, understanding correct that right now ICECAP does not do that? If it was a, for I instance, if, if the secretary ever decided to respond to our March 20, March 25th, uh, 2004 letter, uh, and we wanted to appeal that to ICECAP, we'd be thrown in the pile and, and maybe never re reached at all? And Mr. Leonard could probably answer this. I don't know that the Congress has ever come to ICECAP and asked for that. Uh, there's, no reason, uh, there's no reason why that could not. Uh, be, be processed according, that, uh, according to that, pr 
those procedures. We are presuming, and, of course, that then the, those executives, which would include the Department of Defense Secretary, would then want to respond from that body where they haven't responded individually. But I understand that, what that, you are saying. That's true. And if, I, if I can make one further point, uh, Mr. Congressman, too, that I neglected to make. There is currently on, on the statutory books since uh, 2001 a Public Interest Declassification Board. Uh, this is an outgrowth of uh, Senator Moynihan's uh, Secrecy Commission. It, it was his legacy. Uh, it is, uh, it is, uh, it does exist on the books, as I say. Um, the administration has taken action uh, to, uh, to, to look to appointing some members, but quite frankly, there has been no action from the legislative branch that I'm aware of to appoint their members. And this is an existing forum that does exist that would allow for some of these issues that you that you address to be worked out in, in, in such a manner. Thank you. Mr. Aptitude. Um, I'm taking license here, Mr. Chairman. Is there for the last two of these? If I'm, thank you, Mr. Aptitude. Um, there's a uh, pending proposal. It's been introduced in the House and the Senate. In the House, it's H.R. 4855 to create an independent national security classification board, which would, which I believe is intended to serve as a forum to mediate <coughs> these kind of disputes. <coughs> It, uh, in, in several ways, it really replicates the public interest declassification board that Mr. Leonard mentioned, but it, it's something that may be worth uh, considering. In, to answer your question directly, <coughs> what to do, um, I think uh, look at what works and strengthen it. Ice cap works on a small scale. It, it has led to the declassification of all or part of the majority of disputed cases it has uh, worked on. ISU, Mr. Leonard's uh, uh, organization, if he will forgive me, works. Um, uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I faxed him, a Mr. Leonard, a letter pointing out the, the, uh, the Taguba report seemed to be improperly classified. Uh, he responded to me the very same day, uh, initiating uh, an investigation and, and carrying on some work he already had underway. Um, I thought it was an extraordinary response from a government agency. Nobody responds like that. Uh, but ISU is a, is a tiny organization, particularly when it's compared to the, the vast expanse of the, of the uh, government classification system. But look at what works and strengthen it. I would even say that your, your, your questions that have been stonewalled are not without effect. I don't think Ted Postol would say that you have accomplished nothing. I would say, I think he would say you've accomplished a great deal by standing up for his interests um, uh, over a period of years. Uh, regular hearings um, are, are very important. I think uh, perhaps when Mr. Leonard's organization puts out his annual review of the classification system, it might be an opportune time to hold regular oversight hearings on what's going on in the classification system, what's going right, what's going wrong. Um, harness the courts. The, the scope of judicial review has shrunken over the, over the years to the point that courts now routinely defer to executive branch agencies. They say, if you say it's classified, that's all we need to know, we're not going to look further. That is not what Congress intended when it enacted the Freedom of Information Act. I think uh, if, if there's the political will, it would be very desirable if Congress could say, our intention is that the courts do real review of classification decisions. That doesn't mean overturn them all the time. It means look at them and see if they make sense. Do not defer. Exercise your ju judicial function. If that can be accomplished, then, then a great deal will have been done. Thank you. Mr. Crowell. Um, Mr. Turney, I think in fairness to the Markle Foundation, I should say that they have not studied this issue and I cannot represent them on it, but I do have personal views. I'd love to hear your personal views. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I participated in the uh, uh, Commission on Secrecy that uh, Senator Moynihan conducted and as a result of some of that participation, I have seen large numbers of uh, uh, government documents released and, and declassified. Um, my personal belief is that uh, we have to start with the policies that currently exist and the guidelines that currently exist at the department and agency levels. And we have to refine them and redefine them in some ways in which we emphasize what needs to be released to the public and what must be shared with other agencies in order to uh, conduct the fight on terrorism, uh, as opposed to the current mechanism, which is 
oriented toward what must be protected. Uh, secondly, guidelines that are completely in, uh, consistent with those policies should be developed in each agency. Each agency has a unique problem that they have to deal with in terms of substance and so on, but they should be refined even further to, uh, and issued in each agency and then reviewed by those departments to make sure they are consistent with the policies of release and of sharing. Uh, thirdly, there should be metrics and audits that are conducted, as many of them as possible conducted in automated means, which means that you actually look at trends that were discussed uh, here by the, uh, by the committee. And each agency expected to review those audits and those trends and make reports. Um, finally, there should be a compliance uh, uh, mechanism which says, here are the consequences of not following these policies. Um, and I said finally, but I think the final thing is that there should be reports to Congress which um, essentially say how the policies and guidelines are being followed and how consistent the practices and conformance is across the entire government. I think that's uh, at least a fair way in which to begin to approach the problem. That's very helpful. Thank all of you for your testimony. Thank the gentleman. I, um, I want to just first start out by saying I have this impression that the president is in charge and then it degenerates into 4,000 people who then make the decision. Uh, I use the word degenerate, but I mean, in other words, it goes down to 4,000 people. Is that a right impression or a wrong impression? I, the one thing I would modify that with Mr. Chairman is the critical role that agency heads play. Uh, the president in his executive order directs agency heads to take personal involvement in this, to ensure the commitment of senior management. So how many people do we think it would be? In other words, if a president uh, wanted uh, to delegate to one person and say, we need to change this and I want to get everybody together, uh, you're not going to get 4,000 people together. How many people would the president need to get together with? Um, you would need to get together um, uh, those agency heads with original classification authority, as well as especially those agencies with uh, other unique statutory or regulatory authorities in, in this related area. So uh, I, 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 you're talking dozens. I, I can't give you an exact count, but it is. But it, it would is, just be dozens. I'm sorry, sir. It would just be dozens. It'd be under 100. To, uh, to, to uh, yes, sir, I, I, I firmly believe that those 4,000 original classifiers re can respond very effectively to, to the leadership of their individual agencies. Right. That's where the tone is set. That's where, that's where, um, my, 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 Let me just say, where I think the tone is set is at the very top. And I, I, I have this general view that most presidents, but particularly this administration, um, uh, believes that the less known, the better. I happen to believe the more known, the better. Um, I think they draw on experiences of past presidents, Iran Contra, you, you, you go through this list of it, uh, uh, and, and there's this general view that I hold that you, 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 you don't talk. You don't tell, you don't discuss, you don't disclose. And um, that's a view I hold as a Republican about, frankly, a Republican administration. But at any rate, that the tone is set to, to the agency heads, and you believe that ultimately the agency heads set the tone for the various people, the 4,000 people that work under them. Uh, absolutely, sir. The, the, the secrecy is, 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 is an important tool, especially in time of war. And, um, but it's a tool that comes at a price. At a, at a, at a, at a, there's a consequence to secrecy. Um, and my, my frustration is, is that I do not believe that uh, <clears throat> this government, in, in, through, through its agencies, consistently approaches the issue of to classify or not as a deliberate process, as an informed process. That, it, it, that secrecy in some quarters is almost a fundamental first response. Secrecy 
should, can be a fundamental issue, and it should be. It's a fundamental tool, but it should never be an automatic first response because there's consequences to it. And that's what we have to uh, uh, instill from my perspective, a more informed and a more deliberate process in terms of this to classify yeah, let, or to let not. Me, let me get into that in a second. But uh, <coughs> Ms. Hab, do you disagree with the general view that it's the president down to agency heads, then 4,000 people? Well, clearly there's a framework that we work to that um, that is executed by the agency heads through the department. Um, I will say that with respect to a number of the reports that are coming out now and because of the interest in them, that w the time frame by which we would do these security reviews normally has been shortened. And in fact, the department has had a, f a uh, actually a good history of declassifying large amounts of information. In fact, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy has initiated a uh, tiger team, if you will, to look at documents pertaining to pre-Iraq and Afghanistan as to whether or not they can now, in fact, be declassified. So I think there, there is uh, no doubt uh, that at the top the tone is set. And I think that is executed through the, through the department uh, we have two point, you know, somewhere on the order of two million cleared personnel. Uh, that's equivalent, roughly, I think, to the population. What does that mean? Two, two million cleared people personnel. who have clearances, okay. S confidential, secret, top secret. Okay. Um, that's roughly, I think, the equivalent to the population of the state of Rhode Island. So it's not an inconsequential effort that we go through. The department, the way the department does it, is that it's decentralized. I don't, I don't, I don't know what that, that, that says to me. You're saying two, two million people can look at classified documents. How does that relate to the issue of overclassification? It, what, it, what it says is that how we conduct our training, how we conduct our oversight, we probably are the largest organization that has okay, classified information. I understand, but, but I, don't, I don't gain any comfort from that or not because once something is classified, I don't have the right to talk about it. Correct. I don't have a right to talk about it. I have oversight of the department, I can't talk about it. And I can give you a, see, I have 17 years now of, of experience and, and some huge disagreements with your department. And, and I mean, my own government's Department of Defense. I, I'll, I'll, it, it, you know, and I'm grateful for what the Department of Defense does. But I can go back to 1991, where I had an inspector general who said they classified a study. Our study was that we had determined that 40 percent of the masks were basically leaking. These are the chemical masks. And nobody is doing anything about it, and it's classified. So they came to me. I went to Senator Regal at the time, and who also knew about this, to say, what do we do about this? And there was this play on two different parts. One is we didn't want to disclose. First off, the Army disagreed that they were vulnerable and that they leaked. So we debated for six years on whether the Inspector General's report was accurate, which for the most part was. And, and, and we had this issue of, well, do we declare that we're vulnerable? But then I had this knowledge that the men and women who were putting these things on were putting on masks that didn't basically work. They didn't know it. Now, the department was saying, well, it's still a debate. It didn't seem to me we should have debated for six years whether this Inspector General's report was valid. And yet, we finally outed this report when we started to talk about Gulf War illnesses because it happened to relate to it. And then it was made public by the Department of Defense. They put it on the Internet, and then they took it off. And, I mean, that's just one experience that I've had. And frankly, it's, it, 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 I, I just, for the life of me, don't know how to have dealt with it. I couldn't disclose it, uh, and yet I knew about it. Um, I'd like to know, Mr. Afgood, Mr. Uh, uh, um, Mr. Afgood, first, why don't you just start? Do you, is this a president to executive heads to 40,000, to four, potentially 4,000 people? Um, my perception is that it's the agency head level that is the most important, perhaps even more important in some ways than the president. Uh, if you look back uh, over the past decade, uh, what you see is that openness and transparency flourish where the agency head cares about the subject and wants it to happen. 
they care about it, it happens. If they are indifferent, it doesn't happen. Uh, in the Clinton administration, we had uh, former Energy Secretary Hazel O'Leary, who in fact got way out in front of her own ad administration with an openness initiative. Uh, some people said she declassified to a fault. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that, but the point is she cared about the issue. She made it a priority. It happened, even over the resistance of her own agency. In the first Bush administration, uh, DCI Robert Gates um, uh, had his own modest uh, openness initiative in the intelligence community. It's the agency heads who really make yeah. stuff happen. Yeah. Don't want us to be naive. I don't want us to be foolish. Uh, but I just really believe when I look at the documents that I've seen, um, my number comes closer to the 90% overclassified than the 10% because I would tell you page after page, slide after slide, I, I, I would look at the Army folks, that, the Marine, the, the Air Force, the Navy folks who would give me these briefings, whether in Iraq or anywhere else, and I'm saying, is this classified? And it would have you know, some classification. And I would, I would be dumbfounded as to yeah. why. And when I collectively, when I start to think about it, I can hardly think of a, a few things that I thought were classifiable material. Let me, let me ask you, um, Mr. Kroll, your view of the, the president, the agency heads, and then the 4,000. Is that the way we, you, you view it? Uh, I, again, this is a personal answer, not uh, reflective yeah, of Yeah, a personal Martin's answer study. based on the fact that you, you know, I, I read your bio. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly personal have some experience. Yes, you have a hell of a lot of experience, <laughs> and that's not secret. Um, I, I would agree first of all, that the overall tone is set in policies that come from the presidents to departments, but I would also agree with the members of the panel that the agency heads really set the tone for what happens on a day-to-day -day basis, on whether or not people are properly trained, properly oriented, and whether or not there are any consequences whatsoever for classifying something improperly. Okay. So you want to I want to go for a few more minutes. Do you have questions afterwards? Okay. Let, let me do this. Um, let me ask this one other question, then go to, to Mr. Tierney. Um, you get the quote for the day, Mr. Leonard. You said, for example, it is no secret that the government classifies too much information. <laughs> what is a secret to me is whether it's 10 percent or 90 percent. I'm going to ask each of you to give me your best estimate of whether you think we classify, overclassify too much uh, to the level of 10 percent or closer to the level of 90 percent. I'm going to give you an opportunity to answer last. You had the quote of the day, but you can get the answer. Uh, Mr. Kroll, I wanted you to give me the answer. What is a secret <coughs> to me is uh, whether it's 10 percent or closer to 90 percent. Um, in all fairness, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I have to put some context around the question. I realize, I realize you framed it carefully. I'd like to frame the answer carefully. Okay. Um, I believe with regard to uh, advanced technologies and weapon systems and so on, it would, it would be um, more favorable to proper classification initially, uh, but it would remain classified for a longer period of time than most people might consider uh, appropriate when you look at the pace of technology. So, uh, in the today. technology side, you would be closer that we overclassify closer to the 10 percent or less, but over time, it's still classified, and you could then make make the argument that it's closer to the 90 percent over time. Uh, that's correct, sir. Okay. With regard to sources and methods in the intelligence field, um, I would have the same general view, although I'd make it an 80-20 <laughs> cut. At the, um, end, at the end? Would, yes. Uh, okay, it yeah. would be 80 percent properly classified to protect a source okay. or okay. a method and in the beginning, and, and then over time uh, that source of method goes away and it doesn't get declassified. Yeah, and it, um, should, be. And it should be in your judgment. The, uh, with regard to information. Say, and it should be over time be declassified. Yes. Okay. With regard to information, that is the, the essence of conclusions, either of analysis or uh, whatever, I think it tends to be overclassified um, quite heavily 
because people fear that sources and our, our methods will be revealed, when in fact if they did their own careful analysis, they would find that a lot of information uh, just said as information without saying where it came from and who produced it would be unclassified. You know, this is a longer answer than I'm expecting. You want to jump in right now? Okay. The, um, no, but they're, no, but they're good answers. Uh, I'm not, Ms. Kroll, it's, it's not a reflection on you. These are, these are excellent, helpful responses. Mr. Af Af um, Aftergood. My uh, personal access to classified information is, is very limited and entirely unauthorized, so I'm, <laughs> I don't feel qual qualified to answer that uh, 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 in, in any detail. I would say that the, your question is predicated on a, uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a correct assumption that classification decisions are subjective. Could I ask you a question based on your answer? Are you saying you're like Woodward? You just basically get all this information, but you're um, not That's not the way I would put it, but I would say that, you know, sometimes I stumble on stuff, sometimes okay. people send me stuff. Um, okay. That's just the way it is. Um, classification is a subjective matter. You know, I might have my opinion, others will have their opinion. What do you do about it? I think if there are 4,000 people in the executive branch who are out there classifying information, maybe we need, uh, if not 4,000, then at least dozens of uh, uh, individuals or entities distributed throughout the executive branch whose job it is to uh, oversee and to look for overclassification. Many ISUs planted throughout the executive branch that function like antibodies to, to counter inappropriate classification. Um, just as classification authority is widely distributed, maybe we need to find a way to widely distribute declassification authority, people whose only job is to look for overclassification. Okay. You're getting to me like uh, Alan Greenspan. I'm, you're talking in tongues a little bit for me. Uh, my original question was the 10 percent, 90 percent. Oh. And my original answer was, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, you use that as a wonderful opportunity. To, <laughs> and I didn't catch on right away. Ms. Hav. I agree with that. I don't know. No, I, you do know. You do know more than most. I, most I do know. believe that we overclassify information. Uh, I do believe that it, it is um, extensive, not for the purpose of wanting to hide anything, but I will tell you that with respect to military operations, people have a tendency to err on the side of caution and so therefore may in fact classify things and at the time they could in fact be classified. Military operational data tends to be perishable and so after the operation uh, much of that can be declassified. There are clearly things that will continue to take place in an operational environment that we do not want to release um, and those are, you know, have to do with sources and methods and, and, and so those So you're basically kind of saying it's greater than 10 percent but you're not suggesting how much greater? How about if I say 50-50? Okay. No, that's significant. Someone in your experience would say that we tend to do it 50-50. I, I, I think that's quite significant. Thank you. Mr. Leonard. Yes, sir. Um, two, 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 two approaches. One is, is information that shouldn't be classified in the first place, is ineligible to be classified. Um, that's a number that, quite frankly, from my perspective over the past year, is disturbingly increasingly increasing, uh, where where information is being classified that is clear, blatant violation of the order. Other than that, as Mr. Aftergood pointed out, and as I pointed out in my testimony, th this is an, an act of discretion. It's application of judgment by an original classifier. To give some empirical basis to my answer, I I, I serve as the executive secretary for the appeals panel, and at least in that environment. In those instances where the panel still votes to uphold the classification, based upon my over 30 years of security and counterintelligence background, my personal opinion, my personal judgment, is as even that is, 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 is overclassified. And so from that point of view, I would put it almost even beyond 50-50 in terms of when it comes to applying judgment, there's over 50 percent of the information that, while it may meet the criteria for classification, really should not be classified in terms of what we lose, the price we pay from, for classification, outweighs 
any, any perception, any, any uh, advantage we perceive we gain. Okay. Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Hav, when a document uh, comes from the Department of Defense and is, is marked on it for official use only, who creates that, uh, that designation and what exactly does it mean? For official use only is not a classification level. It's, a, uh, it's an exemption, if you will, from public release for certain types of information that may have to do with privacy, it may have to do with proprietary information, it may have to do with law enforcement information. There are categories of information. For official use only does not, does not mean, however, that that is releasable to the public. Right. So let's take an example of a situation where um, a director of operations and testing and evaluation issues a report that he's required by statute to make, comes before the Government Reform Committee and testifies orally as to the content of that report in significant detail without objection from the Department of Defense. There are charts. There are written uh, testimony. Uh, it's on C-SPAN. It's recorded and replayed on C-SPAN. That information is put on websites, remains on websites for an extraordinary amount of time. Groups like the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists and other outside experts review the information and put opinions out with respect to it. And then months later, uh, in answer to a request in this committee that the report be issued out, all of those things being in the public domain for almost a year, uh, the committee gets a document said for official use only. How does that fit in with the classification or with the description that you just gave me? What category does that fall under? Without knowing the substance of the report, sir, it's hard for me to, and, and I will look at the substance of the report. Well, I can tell you the substance of the report was public right. for almost a year. And so. It was uh, publicly stated could, and could is it, a could, statutory report. And for could example. the gentleman suspend, just, uh, just a second. Let me just tell you, this is the challenge that we face as a committee. Um, part of our responsibility is to, as uh, in the context of a public hearing, uh, is to disclose what we've learned. When we get documents for, for official use only, we don't know if that's classified or not classified, and we don't really, frankly. It, it, it's, the way I treat it is you would prefer whoever sends it that it not be publicized, but, but we have every right to publicize it. That's kind of the way I, I interpret it. But well, you, with all due respect, I think it goes beyond that for me, as uh, you know, uh, on that is that is it a point of ludicrous. Yeah, right. You know, when you put it out there in a the public domain for that, the department does not object to his being. Nobody came in and said this individual shouldn't testify. It's a statutory report. And then to try and put some sort of designation, which admittedly is not a classification, it smacks of me of just an attempt to say, I'm going to put this on and hope they don't put it out there because we'd like to keep it secret. And then some years later, when that information is used as the foundation for a very critical report on something that a group of people want to politically do, it's classified retroactively. That's the challenge. I don't expect you to answer this now. I'm not, I don't want to be unfair to you or anything like that, but that's the challenge I want you to take back with you on that because that is an insult to the American people, to the public, to this institution of Congress, which continually struggles with the way in which it's going to do its oversight. If I had to be critical of all the things uh, with this particular Congress, you know, in the last of this 108th, 107th, uh, is it just an absolute abdication of our responsibilities for oversight? Uh, and a lot of it is not the fault of Congress, but the fault of a totally uncooperative administration uh, that will not be forthcoming and will not cooperate and will not work with Congress to allow it to do its job and feels that the executive the prerogative uh, surpasses any responsibility to Congress and doesn't allow or want Congress to do its constitutional uh, functions. And I think we've got to redraw that balance. Congress has to have the ability to have oversight. It should be strong oversight if we're going to have a successful government here, particularly in view of the 9-11 Commission report. If we have as we do have the challenge uh, of homeland security and protecting the, these people or whatever. And if we want to give more authority to a national intelligence director and to a center on counterterrorism, then we had better have an equally aggressive um, congressional oversight or it's going to lead to a, an executive that's out of control with, the, with the, taking this country in a direction we may not want to go. So it has to be corresponding. For us to do the job we need to do against terror, we have to have that National Intelligence Director, I believe, in that uh, counterterrorism center. But that only works if, correspondingly, we have a strong congressional oversight authority that goes in line with what our constitutional responsibilities are. And that means getting this issue of classification under control and not having that kind of a situation where you get, for official use only, nonsense sent up here after it's been in the public domain and then a reclassification just because the report is critical and doesn't let you go off in some ideological 
uh, path here to try to satisfy one element of, of your uh, supporters on that. So I, I thank you. I won't ask you for, the, for an answer on that because it really was more rhetorical than anything. But please do get us your review of that yes, sir, and let us know we do need to get to the bottom of that particular issue. And thank you, each and yes, every one of the witnesses, for the valuable contributions you've made here today. Thank you. I, I agree with the gentleman. You have been a wonderful panel and very helpful. I, I um, just am going to ask another question I'm wrestling with. I don't expect necessarily I'm going to get definitive answers. but. Um, in my capacity as chairman of the National Security Subcommittee, we oversee Defense, State Department, Department of Homeland Security for uh, programs, waste, abuse, fraud. Uh, how well are they running the program? How well are they not? So we have a keen interest in the notification system. We are at, uh, as a general rule, we've been, the country's been at yellow, which is elevated alert. Everybody thinks we've just been at general alert because that's the way we feel. But we're at elevated, and we, when we kick into orange, which is high alert, uh, that's quite significant. We kicked into high alert last December. And we kicked into high alert because we were basically told planes might be hijacked from Europe to the United States and uh, concern that in a high profile event, uh, a dirty weapon might be used. Now, there was more detail to that. The public had a general. Um, a basis to understand it was some like that. So when people called me to say, should their kids fly to Europe during Christmas when they heard we went to Orange, I said, well, I wouldn't have my daughter fly to Europe because she'd have to fly back. And the flying back was the concern. When I had groups say, well, if we went to an event like uh, New Year's Eve in New York, uh, would it make sense to bring my kids? And I said, well, I sure as heck wouldn't bring my child. In fact, I would think twice for going because it is a, it, it, is it a potential target. Now, uh, in the process of having Admiral Lloyd come before us, the deputy of Department of Homeland Security, I asked him, what was the threat? And he said to me, I can't disclose this in an open forum. And I'm thinking to myself, let me get this straight. The terrorists know that they're going to hijack a plane, and the terrorists know they want to do the following. Uh, and the government knows, and, but the public doesn't know that may go to those venues. And I just find that you know, absurd to the point of, of, of wondering, how could he have said no? He did say no. And he said no more than once when I requested it. Walk me through, give me his, you, his best argument uh, as to why he should do it. And it may be a very good one, and, and you can wipe the smile off my face. But tell me the best argument that you would know for not disclosing this information when the terrorists knew and the public uh, and, and, and the committee knew and certain privileged people knew. And by the way, I want to say this to you. Every staff person and every member who got that briefing told me they wouldn't fly to Europe and they wouldn't go to a venue like uh, New Year's Eve in New York. So they knew, the public didn't know, and, and so tell me the best argument there. Without knowing the specifics myself, sir, uh, the best argument that I w could articulate is concern possibly that what we knew, how we knew it, the specificity that we knew it, and whatever might reveal sensitive sources and methods that was used to collect that information. At the same time, though, I would like to make one, one very important point. As you know, the President amended Executive Order 12958 just last year. One of the things we specifically included in that order was that when it comes to homeland security, when it comes to imminent threat to life or to property with respect to homeland security, and there is classified information that individuals need to have, the absence of a security clearance shall not serve as an impediment to the sharing of that information. So, for instance, the chief of police of, of, of New York needed this information. Uh, he could get it. Uh, exactly. Uh, just a couple of months ago, I had a rather senior official come up to me and say this was post-Madrid bombing. He said I was in this environment. I had some uh, senior, uh, senior private sector individuals there. I was telling them what they needed to do post-Madrid. Uh, they wanted specifics. Uh, 
I, I felt compelled that I had to give him specifics, so I disclosed classified information to them. And the reason he was bringing it up to me, he turned to me and said, Leonard, am I going to have problems with my polygraph the next time I take one? And I was able to assure him, absolutely not, because that is exactly what that revision of that policy was intended to, to address. Those types of situations. The challenge now for, for agencies, and not all agencies are there, are to implement this provision within their, their own implementation regulations so as to empower their rank and file to be able to have that same confidence. He did it not because he knew about the policy, he did it because he had the the rank that, that gave them the confidence. But we need to empower our people. That was the intent behind that policy revision. It was very important, and we need to move out on implementing yeah, it. Thank you for sharing that. Is there any question we should have asked any of you that you might have prepared for or think needs to be part of the record? And frankly, sometimes um, that question elicits some of the most important information we get in a hearing. Is there anything that, that we need to put on the record? Anything you feel guilty about that wasn't? <laughs> Um, I might add one quick thing. Um, this whole subject has, has been investigated by a congressional commission led by Senator Moynihan, the Commission on Protecting and Reducing Government Secrecy. They took a year or more, a couple of million dollars, produced an excellent report, uh, a whole series of recommendations. Uh, it essentially went nowhere. Um, I think one of the lessons of that is that one should not be overly ambitious in trying to fix this whole problem at a single blow. And that's why I think it is of particular importance that the 9-11 Commission recommendation to start with intelligence budget declassification is such an astute one because it is a finite, specific, achievable goal that will have positive consequences throughout the system. And, and if I could reiterate one point, Mr. Chairman, I, I alluded to it before, but speaking of Senator Moynihan again, there is his legacy, the Public Inter Interest Declassification Board. That, that is legislation that was passed several years ago. It's on the books. It's never um, come to fruition. I, I personally would urge you, to the extent you can, to confer with, with leadership uh, in the legislative branch to see if there's a way to move forward with that. It's, it's, it's not a silver bullet. It's not a solution. But it is a tool that's out there right now that provides for a legislative executive branch interaction on this issue. And, um, and I know, th uh, from my, my understanding, I believe the, the executive branch is, is, is ready to make some uh, um, uh, nominations to, to serve on that board. Well, that's uh, interesting as well. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, I also would like to say that I think the discussion really needs to be about risk and how much risk we're willing to take. For example, if another organization has information that is relative to the Department of Defense and the protection of lives, and we, will, and we would like to have that information released to protect our forces. Is it that one person could be saved, 10 people could be saved, 100 people, 1,000, 10,000? At what point does that risk decision uh, come into play, and, and how do we make that risk decision on the best interest of the nation? Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Cole, did you have any? I would just like to underscore um, some of the things that were said earlier about the contributions of Senator Moynihan and his Commission on Secrecy, but also about the book he wrote afterward, which was called Secrets, or Secret, uh, Secrets which is a, a remarkable study of the history and the impact of decisions that have been made by people throughout history, both positively and negatively, uh, on, the con uh, on the country and our uh, well-being. Thank you very much. I, I also want to um, thank uh, Mr. Leonard and Ms. Uh, Ms. Hab, uh, as government officials, to be able to have you sit in the same panel uh, with non-government officials. Um, it, um, it helps us do our job better, and, and I appreciate you not making that an issue. This was really a very interesting panel, and uh, I learned a lot, and uh, uh, we got uh, our work cut out for us, but I think it's important work. And I thank you all for the work you all do. Thank you. For that, this hearing is now adjourned. Excellent. Excellent hearing. You're right. Good job. They're sometimes the best panelists. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever been to the uh, National Cryptologic Museum? 
I, you know, I've meant to go for a long time, but I, I haven't. You should go. Uh, this is one of the things that Admiral Studeman and I uh -huh, did. Aha, uh aha, -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could have put Admiral Studeman on that list also. He's also... Uh, uh, And a program reminder, you can see this hearing again tonight at 8 o'clock Eastern here on C-SPAN, the House International Relations Committee meeting at this hour. That's live on C-SPAN 2. They're hearing from the 9-11 chair and co-chair Tom Kane and Lee Hamilton. And you can watch that hearing tonight again at 8 o'clock Eastern on C-SPAN 2. And by the way, we've also heard that uh, House Speaker Dennis Hastert is set to announce the new chairman of the House Intelligence Committee replacing Porter Goss, you may remember, as been tapped by President Bush to head the CIA. Speaker Haster will make that announcement we hear tomorrow. More information as we get it. And tomorrow, the 9-11 report and U.S. transportation. Two hearings for you on C-SPAN. First, aviation security at 10 a.m. Eastern. Commissioner John Lehman meets with the House Transportation Subcommittee. Mr. Lehman visits a separate subcommittee at 2 o'clock. The topic there, maritime security. 9-11 Commissioner Jamie Grellick will also be